Hello, I'm Mr. Terry, high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, there has been some uh, very interesting news and developments recently, if you're watching this, about when I post it. And that is between the conflict right now going between Russia and Ukraine. Now, I largely on my channel avoid a lot of modern political situations, but I feel that it is important to jump in and discuss historical context to events that are happening here today. Uh, because I find so often those things are not discussed. And a lot of people make evaluations, judgments based off of the actions kind of right now and don't understand the historical context. And I believe that understanding history is one of the most important things you can do because it puts a lot of modern things into perspective and it makes for more educated uh, approaches to problems that go on in the world today. Anyway, there's a ton of coverage that you can find out about this, but one video I wanted to check out because it is getting a lot of popularity right away, and it looks like a lot of comments and things, and that is this video by Johnny Harris. Now, Johnny Harris is a popular YouTuber, and the title of this video is The Real Reason Putin is Preparing for War in Ukraine. And again, this video just kind of popped out to me as something that I hope does a very good job at historical context. But again, I'm always afraid that that could be lacking. Hopefully, I can provide some value in adding that where I feel is necessary. Now, I do not have political motives with this channel or anything like that. I just simply, with my experience as a teacher and somebody that has studied history and worked in history now for a long time, that I can add to that and give people just a better understanding of things. That's all. All right, the original video link is down below. You can support uh, Johnny Harris's channel. And again, if you like what you're seeing here, love to have you around. If you like the video, hit the sub button, enable notifications. You'll definitely see more content. All right, and with that, let's get started. All right, already context, I'm hoping comes up in this this video is definitely soviet era politics cold war politics world war ii but i also hope that it goes back to the russian empire uh, you know before the soviet union um, because expansionism under russia goes back again many many centuries um, again i'm hoping that stuff's brought up and those are the some of the some of the things that if we don't see in this video you could definitely expect me chiming in on all right let's do this a russian invasion of ukraine Momentum is building for a war between Ukraine and Russia. Tensions between Russia and the West are growing rapidly. President Biden considering deploying thousands of troops to Eastern Europe. There are now 100,000 troops on the eastern border of Ukraine. That's a lot. That's, that's not a minuscule number, 100,000 of anybody. That's, that is a lot. It's a lot. And it's going to cause apprehension. Russia is setting up field hospitals on this border. Like, this is what preparation for war looks like, a legitimate war. Ukrainian troops. I did not know about the field hospitals. That it adds it too, because again, wh why would you put such a thing in? Is it because you're expecting injuries or just to make it be shown that you're very serious about military action, right? And this, again, this is as old as history itself about intimidation through uh, military, military preparedness, defense. You know, whatever it is you want to you want to consider what's happening there, right? Defense, aggression, whatever. Troops are watching and waiting, saying they are preparing for a fight. The U.S. has ordered the families of embassy staff to leave Ukraine. Britain has sent all of their non-essential staff home. And now the U.S. is sending tons of weapons and munitions to Ukraine's army. And we're even considering deploying our own troops to the region. I mean... Not not unprecedented here with the United States. He's already introducing things with of of arming groups that may share alliances or, or be an alliance or um, share political goals or whatever like that. That is not unprecedented by the United States. I mean, this thing is heating up. Meanwhile, Russia and the West have been in Geneva and Brussels trying to talk it out and sort of getting nowhere. The message is very clear. Mm -hmm. Should Russia take further aggressive actions against Ukraine, the costs will be severe and the consequences serious. It's a scary, grim momentum that is unpredictable, and the chances of miscalculation and escalation are growing. I want to explain what's going on. I mean, this stuff definitely happened back in 2014. Uh, when you had the kind of annexation crisis in Crimea. That's another thing I'm sure will be talked about here context-wise is something 
on some kind of scale happened, you know, again, within the last decade um, with Ukraine, uh, with Crimea, which, again, is a different story because the, the story of Crimea itself, which is kind of the southern tip, I'm hoping they show maps and stuff here, of um, Ukraine has a little bit different story historically speaking, in its relationship with Russia and cultural connections, though, than um, sometimes the rest of Ukraine. Going on here, But I want to show you that this isn't just typical geopolitical behavior, stuff that can just be explained on the map. Instead, to understand why 100,000 troops are camped out on Ukraine's eastern border, ready for war, you have to understand Russia and how it's been cut down over the ages from a Slavic empire History? that dominated this whole region <laughs> to then the Soviet Union, which was defeated in the 90s. And what Please you go really back further than that, though. Here is how that history is transposed onto the brain of one man, this guy, Vladimir Putin. Okay, so I, I hope it goes back further than just the Soviet Union because you are going to miss a lot of context, too. You're also going to miss context of Soviet Union's actions and... Uh, thing like that because that's built upon that that's it's not like just a total reset button of everything in the history of russia and stuff just happened in the soviet union this is a story about With the creation domination of and struggles between big powers but really it's the story about what vladimir putin really wants russian troops moving swiftly to take control of military bases in crimea i mean you have to put you have to put a lot of things on the action of vladimir putin is an extremely powerful person Probably need some Putin history too. Let's see what they do further, with that. I want to say thank you to today's sponsor, which is BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a platform that allows you to access. Just so you know, I like to support when video content therapy. creators have sponsors. I want to make sure they get now. sponsored and there. So it has um, as long as I'm allowed world. to do so, I, I really uh, believe that they're let them you know, run their and run their ads not and things accessible like that. To people. So. And BetterHelp is trying to change that, which I really believe in and support with better help you can quickly sign up yeah i hope i hope you know they, they are gonna have to get into some history to of putin as somebody who had experience with the KGB. And, and i don't know if they'll get into necessarily how the politics of the office of president of in russia works in different because uh, there is some interesting ways that network. that can so happen where you have two term right uh, you have two term for me i didn't have any particular uh, whatever uh, holdings of office of the president but you can come back i realized you could come back after a term has been completed and through that process uh, vladimir putin again has been in charge of russia largely directly and if not directly then largely indirectly for again over over two decades is licensed legitimate professional therapist who you connect with over the internet securely which is great because therapy is usually really hard to figure out where's the right therapist where how do i get in that is true book it all of that is usually very difficult at least in my experience another issue and so better help is making it easier so if you want to try this out you can get 10 percent off your first month of better help by going to the link in my description thank you better help for supporting my channel for supporting this work let's dive back in okay let's get up to speed on okay. what's happening here and i'm just going to quickly give you the highlight version of like the news that's happening because i want to get into the juicy part which is like why the roots of all of this good so good good go. good and that's more important i mean that again that's so important i'm glad he just said that that yeah you can get the highlight versions but the the deeper versions the longer the multi-year the historical version and historical context is more important than what goes on right now and yeah okay a few months ago, Russia started sending more and more troops to this border. It's this massive border between Ukraine and Russia. They said they were doing a military exercise, but the rest of the world was like, yeah, we totally believe you, Russia. <laughs> this was right before this big meeting where North America- But I mean, it obviously depends on who you are. Russia has a lot of allies. Russia has a lot of allies, right? I mean, um, yes, the Soviet Union fell, but Russia still has a lot of geopolitical allies. and. It, it, I hope it's not overstating or you don't know. Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union. It was an extremely important part of the Soviet Union. And there's uh, cultural context, too, um, with early, early Russia and some of the origins of Russia being in the Ukraine. So uh, Russia has pretty much more investment in Ukraine of places that don't that doesn't technically belong to them, you know, anymore than other parts of the former Soviet Union. So there is extra motivation right away, just so you know, of Russia to um, want influence in what goes on in Ukraine. 
and European countries were coming together. Go back to the Kiev and Rus for that. A lot of different things like these countries often do in these origins, diplomatic summits. Origins, part, partial soon, origins of Russia. Because of Russia's aggressive behavior coming in and setting up 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine, the entire summit turned into a whole WTF Russia, what are you doing on the border of Ukraine meeting? Before the meeting, Putin comes out and says, listen, I have some demands for the West. And everyone's like, uh, okay, Russia, what are your demands? No one likes ultimatums, <laughs> right? Especially if you clear out, well, if you, if you explain what the consequences for not meeting those demands are. Go to Austria-Hungary and their ultimatum on Serbia that ends up being an escalation point that leads to World War I, right? That's how you respond to that. But again, do you understand if you're given an ultimatum the context as well? That's important too. You know, and I hope like people COVID today, right now. policymakers and stuff, I hope um, understand that as well. Oh, and like that's like surging. So like we don't need your like bluster about what your demands are. And Putin's like, no, here's my list of demands. Oh, so Putin's demands for... I mean, not that I didn't expect it. It looks like Johnny is definitely taking a very uh, hard or critical stance on Vladimir Putin. The summit were this. Number one, that NATO, which is this big military alliance between U.S., Canada, and Europe, stop expanding, meaning they don't let any new members in, okay? So, so Russia's like, no more new members to your, like, cool military club that I don't like. You can't have any more members. Number two. Okay, please don't. I hope, I hope there's more context on what NATO is and why NATO was created. NATO was created after World War II as a post-war alliance by United States and similar uh, um, allies. It's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So like the British are going to join, um, for example. Then other nations start joining on, you know, later on. Uh, uh, France, Germany, Italy, etc. And let's just be honest, it, it was created as a response to Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. I mean, that's what it was. It was the post-war alliance, you know, that changed a lot after the alliance system um, in, in World War II, right? After, immediately after the war was over, alliance between Western European allies and the United States and the Soviet Union, that ended, you know, completely. It happened pretty much <laughs> immediately after the war um, with mistrust and broken promises and things between the leaders of countries with Joseph Stalin and things like that. And that's a, that's a different, that's, that's kind of a different topic um, in, in of itself and why those promises were broken. And there's a context of the Soviet perspective that needs to be discussed, but I guess that's really more of another time, but that, that is the reason NATO was designed to be a counter to Russia. So the Russians both Soviet Union and modern Russia have always had a context of being mistrusting of nato because again it was designed to keep russia in check and by the way russia you know after world war ii in response to nato created you know helped create their own military alliance the warsaw pact with um you know uh, um soviet sympathized uh, nations but more specifically you know uh, countries with communist ambitions so that is your uh, more context right there so there is a context of and, and reasoning behind Russian apprehension of NATO. And when you see NATO expand and especially expand into nations and, and, and growth of it with nations that are like bordering the Soviet Union or the Soviet Union then into um, uh, into modern day Russia, that is going to be seen as escalating as well and worrisome. And especially in Ukraine, I talked about why Ukraine is more important than some of these other places that are near uh, Russia as well, though that NATO withdraw all of their troops from anywhere in Eastern Europe. Basically, Putin is saying, I can veto any military cooperation missiles? or troops going between countries that have to do with Eastern Europe, the place that used to be the Soviet Union, okay? And number three, Putin demands that America vow not to protect its allies in Eastern Europe with nuclear weapons. LOL, said all of the other countries. You're literally nuts, Vladimir Putin. Like. These are the most ridiculous demands ever. But there he is, Putin, with these demands, these very, very aggressive demands. And he sort of is implying that if his demands aren't met, he's going to invade Ukraine. Okay, more context. <laughs> if you've been sticking around with me, thank you so much. I'm hoping I'm adding stuff. The original reason that Joseph Stalin, we'll just, we'll just say the original reason that Joseph Stalin tried to state 
back with the Soviet Union of why countries that the Soviet Union invaded in World War II, right, as they pushed from east to west to counter the invasion of Germany, right, into Soviet Union, which crossed into a bunch of states. But the reason, and this goes back to, I guess we, we need to talk about it now. We, we talk about the mistrust and broken promises or whatever between the leaders of the powerful nations at the end of World War II. But because they had basically made, or and Joseph Stalin had said that those nations that were invaded, Eastern European nations, right, between Germany and Soviet Union, would be allowed, you know, independence after, you know, after uh, after the war was over. And those countries would basically get to decide what their fate's going to be. And what happened is in basically all those countries, the Soviet Union did not leave. Now, the context to understand here was the rationale used by Joe Stalin and the Soviet Union about why they did not vacate those places, or at least didn't handle the situation like the Western Allies expected. And that was the fact that Russia has now been invaded twice by Western Europe specifically by Germany, has been invaded twice, right? World War I and World War II with incredibly damaging effects. And the idea was that the Soviet Union should be able to protect itself better, right? By having a presence in, I guess, what you would call those buffer states in Eastern Europe that separate Central and Western Europe from Russia. I mean, and that's that's an argument. I mean, that's that's obviously an argument because it has historical context to that. Are there other motives for it, you know, trying to spread communism, whatever it is. I mean, that's that different story, but that's at least things that were talked about. And the Soviet Union was was um, accused, you know, by people like Winston Churchill saying they put up an iron curtain, right? So that did this iron curtain has descended upon Europe that's now having this sh sharp divide between communist influence, you know, from Soviet Union and then the Western democracies. But anyways, that's your context there too about the Eastern Europe thing. And another thing to be t uh, talking about, and this goes back to the Cold War, is the whole placement of weapons, um, uh, like rockets that can, you know, attack Russia from closer range. Um, that should, at some point here, I don't know if they're going to talk about like Cuban Missile Crisis and kind of the, um, how there's an example of this like military preparedness crisis of countries that are close to you, whether you're Soviet Union or United States. Anyways, I'm talking too many chunks now. I want to let the video be able to explain if they're able to do that, and I'll, I'll jump in when necessary. I mean, it doesn't work like this. This is not how international relations work. You don't just show up and say, like, you, I'm not going to allow other countries to join your alliance because it makes me feel uncomfortable. But what I love about this list of demands from Vladimir Putin for this summit... People usually don't like that. that. It's true. It gives us a clue on what... It doesn't de-escalate the situation, though. That's the problem. What he's right? after here. You read them closely, and you can grasp his intentions. But to grasp those intentions, you have to understand what NATO is and what Russia and Ukraine used to be. Okay, good. Ooh, okay, okay so awesome. Back, More earlier history. About why hopefully. Russia is so damn big. I saw Kiev or Kiev and Rus. How modern day Russia started here in Kiev, which is actually modern day Ukraine. Mm -hmm. In other words, modern day Russia, as we know it, has its original roots in Ukraine. Right. These places. I think some people might debate a little bit about that, just so you know, but there is there is historical backing here. Up together. And they eventually became a part of the same mega empire called the Soviet Union. They were deeply intertwined, not just don't, in their don't say it started there though. and their culture, but also in their economy and their politics. That's not where it started. That's not where it started though, just so so we know. The Russian Empire. Right? And I'm talking Russia, especially post Peter the Great. Okay, and uh, Peter the Great into Catherine the Great, the you know, great expansionist Russian emperors that wanted to push more into Western Europe. And um, both of them tried and had successes, right? Pushing west and east, we should say, east all the way to the Pacific Ocean, because that's when that happens through Siberia. Or, yeah, and, and then west into especially warm water port areas. That was one of the things that the new Russia, especially under Peter, who ruled uh, in the 1700s, wanted from Russia was warm water port access because he wanted your uh, Russia to be more connected to Western Europe. It's called Westernization. Problem is, at that time, Russia didn't have warm water ports. The Baltic states were not under their control. Um, and that didn't matter either because those aren't necessarily year-round warm water ports. And they also don't connect to the Mediterranean, which is something they wanted. And then you get your wars with uh, the Ottoman Empire later on. And, and Peter had failed to get warm water ports. But uh, fast forward into 
uh, kind of late 1700s. And then you get Catherine the Great, who again was a very powerful uh, Russian empress as well, who had success fighting the Ottoman Empire for Ukraine and for specifically Crimea and those areas so they could have warm water port access. So yeah, that that connection of ruling all the way into into those parts like of Ukraine goes back further, a lot further than the Soviet Union. I mean, the Russian Empire, as it was called and was. So it's after World War II, it's like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and NATO was formed, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was a military alliance between all of these yeah, countries go. that was meant to sort of deter the Soviet Union from... Keep an eye. All of I don't know if they're going to get to it on Turkey. That's a very important one because this provided early on in NATO and the alliance after the formation of the, the country of Turkey and a place the United States invested heavily in militarily and uh, were placing missiles, right? You got a nuclear arms race into, uh, into Turkey right here, specifically because of its short range to major Soviet Union cities, which was very, uh, very much a cause of apprehension by or for the Soviet Union, who then felt, well, if the United States can put those in those kind of weapons in Turkey, then, you know, allies of the Soviet Union should also be able to have those types of weapons, thus prograding the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Cuba and the Soviet Union had a relationship, and Soviet Union was planning to, you know, put, put those weapons and things into Cuba. And that, just like it did, you know, with the Soviet Union and Turkey, provide a lot of apprehension for the United States because Cuba, of course, is right down here at a shortest distance, is only about 90 miles from the coast of the United States. So that's what the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you can see a little bit about um, Soviet Union and, and now under Russia, uh, possibly being uh, having apprehension about NATO nations much closer to the Russian border. These countries that was meant to sort of deter the Soviet Union from expanding and taking over the world. But as we all know, the Soviet Union, which was Russia and all of these other countries, collapsed in 1991. And all of sure. these Soviet republics, including Ukraine, became independent. became independent, meaning they were not mm. now a part of one big block sure. of countries anymore. But just because the borders all split up, it doesn't mean that these cultural ties actually broke. Like, for example, the Soviet leader at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. A lot, a lot of them did, because I mean, I mean, some of them did. It depends on each each country has a little bit different story, and it usually came down to their treatment under their years under the Soviet Union, right? If they felt it was better, they might still be more allied with them, um, but then some might have took a, a very different turn in joining with NATO because they didn't like the Soviet years. Guy Gorbachev, he was the son of a Ukrainian mother and a Russian father. Like he grew up with his mother singing him Ukrainian folk songs. And Stalin and was mind, Georgian. Ukraine and Russia were like one thing. So there was major reluctance to accept Ukraine as a separate thing from Russia. In so many ways, they are one. There was another Russian at the time who did not accept this new division. This young intelligence officer, Vladimir Putin, Putin. who was starting to rise up in the ranks of post-Soviet Russia. There's this amazing quote from 2005 where Putin is giving the State of the Union like address where Putin declares the collapse of the Soviet Union, quote, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And as for the Russian people, it became a genuine tragedy. Tens of millions of fellow citizens and countrymen found themselves beyond the fringes of Russian... Not gonna lie, I, I actually... That highlighter's kind of cool that he's used in there. It's just to see um, the lead up to this, if he was talking... What, what in a larger context he was talking a lot about, like, for example, when he when he talks about geopolitical ca catastrophes, what, was he implying the context, of course, of the world wars and, and um, you know, as well as, you know, t 20 million Russians die in World War II and that kind of thing? So if he's considering that, you know, into it, then, yeah, I guess they, they might uh, a lot of people would say it by justifiably so that, yeah, that's that's. That's a bit old hyperbolic there, right? That's the the greatest geo geopolitical catastrophe of the century, the fall of the Soviet Union. So that would make people think that he's very much still an extension of the Soviet Union, where um, people really debate that, you know, as as his beliefs may go in line with that, but also a, a lot don't. Sorry. Do you see how he frames this? The Soviet Union. Yeah, that's very hyperbolic. One people in his mind, and after it collapsed, all of these people who were a part of the motherland were now outside of the fringes or the boundaries of Russian territory. First off, fact check. 
greatest catastrophe of the 20th century? Like, do you remember what else happened in the 20th century, mm -hmm. Vladimir? World Wars. Putin's worry about the collapse of this one people starts to get way worse when the West, his enemy, starts showing up to his neighborhood to all these ex-Soviet countries right. that are now independent. The West starts selling their ideology of democracy and capitalism and inviting and weapons. them to join their military alliance called NATO. And guess what? These countries are totally buying it. All these ex-Soviet countries are now joining NATO, and some of them, the EU, and Putin is hating this. And again, a major reason for that is the incredible amount of military um, armaments and money that you get from NATO that, you know, the United States pays a lot into um, for these countries. You can get a lot out of it militarily without having to spend a lot of your own resources for it and not even necessarily share cultural or political values necessarily but for the military advantage that it gives you and i guess the money you can save uh, by doing that because um, the payment and stuff into nato and how money is moved around is very imbalanced he's like not only did the soviet union divide and all of these people are now outside of the russia motherland but now they're being persuaded by the West to join their military alliance. This is terrible news. Over the years, this continues to happen. Remember, we gotta, we gotta understand, it is a, it, NATO is a military organization, right? It's not like the EU, which again is focused on economics and things like that. Um, but it is a, a major way of the United States being able to get involved into politics in, uh, in Europe without being European and not being in the EU. European Union. Putin himself starts to chip away at Russian institutions, making them weaker and weaker. He's silencing his rivals and he's consolidating power in himself. Notoriously silencing people and organizations. Assassinations, jail. And in the past few years, he's effectively silenced anyone who can challenge him. Any yeah. institution, any court, or any political rival yeah. have all been silenced. Mm -hmm. Notorious for that. It's been decades since the Soviet Union. You know, again, label them terrorists or whatever, and then they uh, end up missing. And that's been, again, notorious, again, by somebody coming from the KGB and intelligence and all this stuff who knows how to work that, that system. Fell. But as Putin gains more power, he still sees the region through the lens of the old Cold War, Soviet, Slavic sure. Empire view. He sees this True. region as one big block that has been torn apart by outside forces. Yeah, people say, you know, what he's doing is just trying to reform the Russian Empire. And we can't just say Soviet Empire. We mean Russian Empire. We got to go a, a context that goes centuries, not just a century. Okay, got to keep the big picture there. The greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And the worst situation of all of these, according to Putin, is Ukraine which was like the gem of the yeah. Soviet Union. There was tons of True. cultural heritage. Again, Russia sort of started in Ukraine, not to mention it was a very populous and industrious, resource-rich place. And over the years, Ukraine has- Port cities, Crimea, Sevastopol, all those places, Sochi, like these are, uh, that whole area around the Black Sea, extremely important um, economically. It's been drifting west. It hasn't joined NATO yet, but more and more it's been electing pro-Western presidents. It's been flirting with membership in NATO. It's becoming less and less attached to the Russian heritage that Putin so adores. And more than half of Ukrainians say that they'd be down to join the EU. 64% of them say that they would be cool joining NATO. You're also gonna have a, a big, and we'll see if they get to much of the Crimean, modern Crimean situation where those votes would also look um, would look different in Crimea than the rest of Ukraine because the difference in Crimean history versus the rest of Ukraine. But Putin can't handle this. He is in total denial. Like an ex-boyfriend who can't handle his ex-girlfriend starting <laughs> to date someone else, Putin can't let Ukraine go. He won't let go. So for the past decade, he's been trying You're going to down the if I can't have you. and bring Ukraine back into the motherland of Russia. This mm -hmm. usually takes the form of Putin sending secret soldiers from Russia into Ukraine to help yeah. the P-51 
people in Ukraine who want to like separate from Ukraine a lot of internal intervention it also takes by the form of the Russians oh, yeah, in the Crimea stealing situation stealing entire too. parts of Ukraine for Russia Russian troops moving swiftly to take control of military bases in Crimea like in 2014 yeah. Putin just did this what America is right. officially calling a Russian invasion of Ukraine he went down and just well they also had the referendum are they going to talk about that Ukraine and folded it into Russia so you're starting to see what's going on here well they had a, a vote whatever I, I i i'd have to look into more if, uh, if, if there's allegations of massive fraud or whatever but um the ukrainians vote or the crimeans in ukraine they had this this vote right to join to either remain with ukraine or basically join russia and the votes were quite heavily for um for russia for unification with russia or joining russia and again the crimea situation is different than the rest of ukraine though Putin's life's work is to so that that is going to be there's a different scenario than the one for the rest of Ukraine if you're talking about Crimea salvage what he calls the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century the division and the separation of the Soviet republics from Russia so let's get to present day it's 2022 Putin is at it again and honestly if you really want to understand the mind of Vladimir Putin not out of nowhere though this, you have to read this on the history of unity of Russians and Ukrainians by Vladimir Putin. I mean, Putin does declare himself to be like someone well versed in history. So a blog post that kind of sounds like a we'll ninth see if it's grade history essay. In this essay, yeah. Vladimir Putin argues that Russia and Ukraine are one people. He calls them essentially the same historical and spiritual space kind of i want to be i want to be absolutely sure not to speak for ukrainians on this situation too so i i, I don't want to interject in that if i want to give these full connections especially today okay I'm not talking about origins of the the kiev and rus and stuff like that that's that's different right than how ukrainians might feel themselves say so i don't want to speak for them if you are ukrainian definitely uh let us know comments and stuff like that and you can give us some insight maybe that way what a beautiful writing honestly anyway he argues that the division between the two countries is due to quote a deliberate effort by those forces that have always sought to undermine our unity and that the formula wait are they saying those that want to divide ukraine they want to rule over ukraine so you're saying like nato wants to rule like take over ukraine like against their will or something they use the What's outside Putin forces mean? is a classic one divide and rule and then he launches into this super in-depth like 10 page argument as to every single historical beat of ukraine and russia's history to make this argument that like this is one people and the division is totally because of outside powers i.e the west you know, and one thing that they're they're good at, and Vladimir Putin's good at too, is having this stuff, like these beliefs, like this, going through mainstream media or their their media, which again is far more heavily controlled by the government than than other places, of making this the popular narrative that will get commonly accepted and discussed uh, in Russia. Okay, but listen, there's this moment at the end of the post that actually kind of hit me in a big way. He says this, just have a look at Austria and Germany. Very like ethnically the US tied. and Canada. US Canada. How they live Very ethnically tied. to each other. Close in ethnic composition, culture, and in fact sharing one language, sure. they remain sovereign states with their own interests, with their own foreign policy, but this does not prevent them from the closest integration or allied relations. They have very conditional, transparent borders, and when crossing them, citizens feel at home they create families study work do business incidentally sure. so do millions of those born in ukraine who now live in russia we okay, we okay. sorry i didn't know when he was stopping close people okay so I'm trying to still see what he's saying. Because, yeah, undeniable ethnic ties, historical ties, Austria and Germany, Anschluss, right, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> uh, United States and Canada, for sure. And, again, there's different contexts there just from the American Revolution, you know, why Canada and U.S. are, are split there and how the British responded and that kind of thing. But, but was the point here that Ukraine should remain independent and just act – like the relationship between us and canada and austria and germany or 
saying they should just be like completely unified like ukraine and russia should be completely unified because again that's not what is happening with these other countries not politically speaking yeah cultural connections but not politically border wise so i don't know which side just from this quote that putin would be saying should be the relationship with ukraine i mean listen like What's johnny think? I, i'm not in support of what Putin is doing, but like that, that's like a pretty solid like analogy. If China suddenly showed up and started like coaxing Canada into being a part of its alliance, sure. I would be a little bit like, what's going on here? Oh, the United that's States. That's what Putin feels. And so I kind of okay. get what he means there. There's a deep heritage and connection between these people. And he's seen that falter and dissolve and he doesn't like it. Okay, so yeah, that's something, uh, I think a thought exercise that maybe you should ask yourself, especially if you're an American. How would you feel, again, if, if China or Russia, whatever, was really, really supporting pro-China or whatever, pro-Russian pro, pro um, um, uh, Russian movements in, the, in, in like, let's say, just say Canada, place, again, has a good relationship with the United States. But we have to add to that because what we need to be, needs to be talked about in context here is how like if the united states wants to put like missiles and military equipment you know in ukraine and then to flip that how would you feel if again russia here today was what had missiles and again military uh, products in canada very close to the united states i mean i think i think at least i would think that would cause an a great amount of, of, of apprehension um, for the united states and the government would would do something about it right the government would would absolutely do something like that you do see an extreme version of that of course with the cuban missile crisis and that if you want to look at context a precedent that's exactly what happened right i, I alluded to, i talked about this earlier not again i don't know if he's going to do it but i'll just explain it now you know after the after you know and during the cold during the cold war there the united states was putting missiles into turkey that were within range of uh, very close range of Russia. So, you know, the Soviet Union believed that it should only be fair then that their ally Cuba is a place where the Soviet Union could also put weapons, right? And then once that happened, the whole Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States came down hard, right? Put the blockade in. People thought that a nuclear war was going to be imminent there. And it caused a huge deal, and what ended up happening there was, yeah, they, they, they forced the um, Soviet Union to dismantle those um, those uh, uh, missiles and any any type of uh, place or any, any any way that that could happen, right? To have those kind of materials there, and it seems just based on precedent and context that a similar thing would happen if the United or if Russia did the same thing with Canada today, it would be seen as as um, um, very much escalating by by the American public and the American government and would see some type of intervention in some way, right? If you disagree, let me know. I mean, down below, but I'm just using, again, historical context to try to make a prediction of what would happen if something happened in reverse towards the United States. Clearly, genuinely feels a brotherhood and this deep heritage connection with the people of Ukraine. Okay, 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 Putin. I get it. Your essay is compelling there at the end. You're <laughs> clearly very smart and well-read. But this does not justify what you've been up to, okay? It doesn't justify sending 100,000 troops to the border or sending cyber soldiers to sabotage the Ukrainian government or annexing territory, fueling a conflict that has killed tens of thousands of people in eastern Ukraine. No. Well, Putin would say yes for all those. Like, he would say and bring up historical context for all of those things that Johnny is saying right there. Like, there would be an argument made. Again, do you believe the argument? Do you think it's strong enough? Okay. Um, but again, in more modern, this has been very much been in direct response to Ukraine potentially joining NATO and um, uh, uh, NATO weapons going into, the, into Ukraine, specifically from the United States. OK, no matter how much affection you feel for Ukrainian, which, again, has escalated this and, and, and provided more response by Vladimir Putin and its connection to Russia. This is not OK. Again, it's like the mm -hmm. boyfriend who genuinely loves his girlfriend. They had a great relationship, but they broke up and she's free to see whomever she wants. But Putin is not ready to let go. I what know. the hell is wrong with you? I love you, Jessica. What the hell is wrong with you, dude? Don't fucking touch me. Yeah. I love you, dude. What the, what the heck? I know. I know.
Putin has constructed his own <laughs> right. reality TikTok. here, one in which Ukraine is actually being controlled by shadowy Western forces who are holding the people of Ukraine hostage. And if that he invades, it'll be a swift victory because Ukrainians will accept him with open arms. That won't the great happen. liberator. No. The military preparedness on the Ukrainian side is intense as well. It's very intense, and they've stated... No, no, that's not what's going to happen. This isn't going to be the Sudetenland, right, uh, from World War II or something like that. It's it's not going to be that situation. So could there be delusion in that fact potentially, especially if he's gonna if he's gonna predict that what happened in Crimea years ago is what's going to happen with the U.S. rest of Ukraine? Because again, those are t uh, two very different situations. Like this guy's a total romantic. He's a history buff and a romantic. And he mm -hmm. has a hill to die on here. And it is liberating the people who have been taken from the Russian motherland. Kind of like the abusive boyfriend who's like, she actually really loves me, but it's her annoying friends who are planting all these ideas in her head. <laughs> That's why she broke <laughs> Good up. Good analogy. It's like, no, dude. That she's, she's over She's not India anymore. She's not India anymore. With you? I love you, Jessica. I mean, maybe this video should be called Putin is just like your abusive ex-boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> World star being okay. so, a potential giant this? war. It's 2022. Mobilization, man. Mobilization of troops creates, creates apprehension. Let's go back to some more historical examples. The mobilization of the uh, military of Russia in before World War One, right? In the, in the lead up to World War One, based off of Austria's threats to Serbia, who, again, Russia has uh, Slavic connections with Serbs and mobilize their army after the uh, pressure Austria was putting on Serbia after the assassination of the Archduke. And that mobilization escalated the situation, which then brought in, you know, Germany to try to, you know, get get uh, get Russia to back down. And that's that's a different story, too. But mobilization does escalate things. It just does. Putin is showing up to these meetings in Europe to tell them where he stands. He says, NATO, you cannot expand anymore. No new members, and you need to withdraw all your troops from Eastern Europe, my neighborhood. He knows these demands will never be accepted because they're ludicrous, but what he's doing is showing a false effort to say, well, we tried to negotiate with the West, but they didn't want to. Hence, giving a little bit more justification to a Russian invasion. So, will Russia invade? Is there war coming? Maybe, it's impossible to know because it's all inside of the head of this guy, but, if I were to make the best argument that Never know. war is not coming tomorrow, I would look at a few things. Number it's one, good to know. war in Ukraine would be incredibly costly for Vladimir Putin. Russia has a far superior army to Ukraine's, but still sure. Ukraine has a very good army that is supported by the West Yes. and would give Putin a pretty bad Like blood. Like everyone in the West is supporting Ukraine in this knows in any invasion. Controlling territory in Ukraine would be very hard. Ukraine is a giant country. They would fight back and it would be very hard to actually conquer and take over territory. Another major point here is that if Russia invades Ukraine, this gives NATO new purpose. If you remember, NATO was created because of the Cold mm, War. I don't, I don't know if that point will be appreciated though from the Russian perspective or really considered. The Soviet Union was big in nuclear power. Once the Maybe Soviet wrong. Union fell, NATO sort of has been looking for a new purpose over the past couple decades. If Russia invades Ukraine, NATO suddenly has a brand new purpose to unite and to invest in becoming more powerful than ever. Putin knows that, and it would be very bad news for him if that happened. But most importantly, perhaps the easiest clue for me to believe that war isn't coming tomorrow is the Russian propaganda machine is not preparing the Russian people for an invasion. In 2014, really? when Russia was about to invade and take over Crimea, this part of Ukraine, yeah. there was a barrage of state propaganda that prepared the Russian people that this was a justified attack. Okay, this could be some information useful for me um, to know if this is the actual case that, again, the propaganda machine, propaganda machine is not at full speed like it was um, in 2014. So when it happened, it wasn't a surprise and it felt very normal. That isn't happening right now in Russia, at least for now. It, it may start happening tomorrow, <laughs> but for now, I think Putin is showing up to the border, flexing his muscles, and showing the West that he is earnest. I'm not sure that he's gonna to invade tomorrow, but he very well could. I mean, read the guy's blog post, and you'll realize that he is a romantic about this. 
he is incredibly idealistic about the glory days of the Slavic empires. And right. he wants to get that's it back. That's true. Totally so true. So there is... Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that's what... A lot of what, what wants to, to, to happen, to the extent of, like, the Russian empire that way, but um, definitely in that line. Dangerous though, right? momentum towards war. And the way war works is even a small little, like fight can turn into the other guy doing something bigger and crazier and then the other person right. has to respond with something a little bit bigger escalation, that's escalation. called escalation and there's not really a ceiling to how much that momentum sure. can spin out of control. similar to an arms race that is why it's in so general. scary when two nuclear countries go to war with each other because there's kind of no ceiling so well yeah russia can escalate way more than just if it's just ukraine by itself for sure but again what we what you'd have to look at here is as Russia's escalating, is Ukraine going to continue to escalate their side? And just what I mean by that is, you know, mobilize and stuff. But then also, are the other members, nations of NATO, like the United States, going to start putting in troops before any kind of invasion happens? That's something I guess you'd have to look out for to see how far this escalation can go. So, yeah, it's dangerous. This is scary. I'm not sure what happens next here, but the best we can do is keep an eye on this. At least for now, we better understand what Putin really wants out of all of this. Well, he just said, you said uh, Johnny said at the beginning, he, he said what he wants. He wants uh, Ukraine to be untouched by NATO, right? That's the biggest thing right there, I mean, to do that. So will NATO comply with that? Is Will there be a compromise in this situation or... Is it just going to be a conflict of who can intimidate the other more? Thanks for watching. All right, I'll give my final thoughts, and I'm going to want to hear your thoughts as well. All right, so I am glad I was able to talk a lot more about historical context because I do believe there was a lot to uh, that was missing in here. And I'm not one that goes and jumps to the conclusion that you know context is was was like intentionally taken out because again to get all this context you have to do more than a, a 22 minute video which is this and a lot of people do that in youtube comment sections where i see well they say people are intentionally leaving stuff out but you also just got to think of the logistics right and it's us as viewers that need to understand that we need to also seek out the context for ourselves right and do it in a responsible fashion Right, not just going and looking up things to support preconceived uh, views, but to gather as much information about historical context to to events. Right, and hopefully I was able to add to that. Um, with that, again, I tried to remain as just as unbiased or whatever as, as as possible, and just talk about again those events and put them into to things, explaining things, you know, giving explanations, not. Uh, um, you know, not excuses, right? That's that's what I what I try to be, and I hope all good teachers try to be. Is you know, you explain, you 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 know, uh, explain things rather than again trying to to um, make excuses for things. I think that's important. Okay, the valuation can be done on a personal level, but not as an educator. All right. Anyway, uh, I am definitely interested to hear what you have. Again, if you're a Ukrainian and tied to the situation, again, I didn't want to. I tried to avoid speaking for Ukrainians in this situation and also just uh try not to speak for russians either and just again talk about the actions and the words of vladimir putin but not by russians or ukrainians themselves and if you want to chime in i'm sure you will because i've seen in other types of videos about this that russians and ukrainians have been talking a lot and in comments and trying to debunk or just give their own explanations and their own perspectives on things and i think that is very valuable to understand too though that one person's explanation if you're ukrainian or russia does not represent everyone right just like you wouldn't think if you were an american or something that somebody that speaks in some youtube com uh, uh, uh comment section you know speaks for you as well and i think that's important to keep on so again it'll be interesting to see what happens here and uh, uh in the situation and again hopefully you saw some historical context that's going to help you understand these things better all right again if you like this video and you've stayed with me this long i really really appreciate it um hit that like button if you liked what we saw subscribe and if this is the type of content you'd like to see more of where i try to talk about historical context of current events please let me know because i've kind of on the fence about it if that's a direction i should take or if i should 
avoid those type of completely modern political type of discussions in on here on YouTube, if I should avoid that completely for sake of coming out, trying to, uh, you know, not to, to increase bias or show any bias, because that's something, of course, I don't want to do. And I hope, you know, I, I don't do that. All right. With that, thanks again for being here. We'll see you next time. Bye.